Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get the chance to hear from one of WWF's very own experts. My name is Kate, and I will be your host today. And we are thrilled to have Robin Sawyer joining us today. Robin is a senior program officer with the Wildlife Conservation Team here at WWF US. And she's here today to tell us about a very exciting project that she's been a part of, one that involves dogs and how they are able to help protect species like rhinos and elephants. So Robin, we are so excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So before I pass things officially over to Robin, I just wanna take a few minutes to first remind all of you that are watching from the webpage to go ahead and use that Google form that you see on your screen to introduce yourselves and place any questions that you have for Robin throughout her presentation. We will do our best to get as many of those questions answered at the end as we can. And next, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce all of our very special guests that we have joining us on camera today. So when I introduce you, make sure to unmute your microphone and big, give a big warm welcome and hello so that we can all hear you. So first up from Matamoros, Pennsylvania, we have Mrs. Kudrick's fifth graders from Delaware Valley Elementary. <laughs> Awesome. Um, next, joining us from Langley, British Columbia in Canada, we have Mrs. A's Science 10 class at DW Poppy Secondary School. Hello. Hi. Hey, Lyra. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, next up we have Kiara joining us from Middleton, Wisconsin. Hi, Kiara. Hi. And last but certainly not least, joining us from Hamilton, New Jersey, we have Miss Sigmund's fifth graders from Langtree Elementary. <laughs> well, you guys did great so far with those hellos, so I can only imagine the kind of questions that you will have later. So without further ado, Robin, if you're ready, the floor is yours. You can go ahead and share your screen and take it from here. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see it? I think you're in um, a different mode though, Robin. Can you go back oh, to the no. mode you were in before? There you go, hold on. Can you see it now? No, I think you stopped mm -hmm. sharing. You might just have to reshare. Technology. There we go, looks good. Can you see it now? Yes, looks great. Okay. Thank you. Now, of course, my mouse isn't working. I'm sure we okay. can all relate to technology not being our friend sometimes. <laughs> okay. So I am super excited to talk to you guys about dogs, their incredible sense of smell, and how they are an important tool in fighting wildlife crime. But first, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got involved in conservation. And it all started with ospreys. So I grew up in Virginia Beach, my grandfather uh, lived on the water on a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. And my favorite thing to do was to play on his pier. And there was one time where he had blocked off his pier and nobody was allowed to go on the pier. And it's because he built a nest platform for ospreys 
because he wanted them to build uh, their nest and lay their eggs on uh, this platform. And he didn't want anyone to disturb the nest. At the time, uh, populations of ospreys in Virginia were uh, state endangered. And um, he wanted to be part of the reason that the population rebounded. So I was super bummed. I wanted to play on the pier and he took me uh, into his house. It was this octagon shaped house onto the top floor and he had a red telescope that was aimed at this nest. And I got to see these little tiny osprey babies. And he explained at, I think I was about six years old, that there were some human actions that caused populations of wildlife to become endangered. But it was also up to humans to conserve the environment and wildlife because they live here too. And it was this message of conservation that really stuck with me. So all throughout school, any chance I got, I was always writing about conservation, endangered species. I studied it in college and in grad school, and I've been working in this field for 17 years. I've traveled to really cool places, and I'm still very passionate about conservation. And I have my grandfather and ospreys to thank. At WWF, I work on wildlife trade. So quite simply, that is the selling of wildlife or plants locally or internationally. And it's important to note that not all wildlife trade is bad or illegal. Uh, it can benefit conservation and communities. However, illegal wildlife trade is is very bad. And the poaching of wildlife, uh, big populations like elephants and rhinos for their uh, ivory, their tusks, and for their horn is reversing decades of conservation gains. And we're seeing that in a lot of cases, criminal networks are involved and have adopted large scale smuggling techniques. One of the things that we are seeing is uh, using shipping containers to smuggle large quantities of wildlife. So we've seen uh, in these shipping containers, which are roughly the size of a school bus, uh, we've seen false walls be installed where there've been hundreds of, of uh, ivory, of um, elephant tusks hidden there. We've also seen wildlife um, disguised with products like coffee or tea. And the problem is that these shipping containers, um, not all of them get searched at, at seaports. Um, so some of the bigger ports in the world, you could have 2,000 that are arriving per day and only a small percentage get searched. So they're a lot of times just put on the ship and then sent to another place in the world. And so if it has this smuggled wildlife, then it ends up going to its uh, destination market. And so this is uh, some of the work that I'm trying to fix. But I just wanted to take a minute and talk about how great dogs are and how wonderful their nose is. So their nose, their capacity to smell is somewhere between 10,000 to 100,000 times that of a human. So to put it in perspective, we have about five to six million olfactory receptor cells. So that's basically how our nose detects scent. Dogs have 300 million of these olfactory cells, and they even have part of their brain dedicated to analyzing the smells, which helps them distinguish and remember a number of these specific scents. They can also smell through time. So basically they can smell the past. So think about any time you've ever seen a dog stop and smell like a fire hydrant or a tree, that's basically a doggy newspaper. 
they're smelling who was there before, what they ate, who was with them. They're all these tiny little scent molecules that you or I cannot decipher. So when I think I, I get away with petting another dog and my dog isn't aware of it, I'm very wrong. She knows before I've even stepped inside the house that I have played with another dog. That is how good their nose is. And it's because of this wonderful nose and their ability to smell pretty much anything that we use them uh, for different conservation purposes. So there are poop finding dogs. So these dogs literally are trained to find endangered species poop where uh, the information is incredibly useful for scientists. It, it tells scientists uh, where the population is, are they healthy, um, anything that's basically non-invasive, uh, what are they eating, what's the genetics. Uh, there are even some uh, dogs that smell killer whale poop. Um, because believe it or not, killer whale poop uh, rises to the top of the ocean. So these dogs hang out in boats and they alert the scientists when they find uh, killer whale poop. Um, dogs can also find invasive species. Uh, we've used them for anti-poaching purposes. So they're trained to find illegal traps and poachers and weapons. Uh, Anti-trafficking dogs can find uh, hidden wildlife products. Um, in luggage, in shipments, in cargo, shipping containers. And they're even uh, training dogs to find and sniff out COVID-19. And ultimately, for these dogs, finding the target odor is a game for them. So what do all, oops. So what do all of these have in common? A shipping container, some hidden ivory, a vacuum, and a dog. What if I were to tell you that these are a way, the vacuum and the dog is a way to find illegal wildlife products that are hidden in shipping containers. And it works by the vacuum pump. So the air sample is drawn from the shipping container. And in this case, brought to trained dogs that were trained to find elephant ivory and rhino horn. And uh, this enables uh, people who work at the port to be able to sample a lot more of those shipping containers. And it's also a lot healthier for the dogs because they just get to hang out in an air conditioned room and the scents come to them. And what's really amazing is that this technology works. So dogs were able to find elephant ivory and rhino horn based on the air samples taken from this vacuum. The problem is that the technology is expensive and it means that many of these ports can't afford to use this technology at all. So what I'm trying to do is build our own cheap vacuum from everyday materials in hopes that we can make this technology accessible to all. So just last month, uh, we conducted an experiment. We wanted to see if we could take an everyday vacuum and some trained dogs and some shipping can containers to see if the dogs could find the hidden wildlife products from an air sample. So for this experiment, we used this uh, beautiful Craftsman vacuum, which we bought at Lowe's for $80. We worked with uh, three trained dogs. Uh, the dogs were trained to find uh, elephant ivory and shark fin, and they are part of a, a group that we work with called Working Dogs for Conservation. And we used some empty shipping containers that we would fill with uh, some test materials like shark fin and ivory, and also some distractor scents like coffee and, and dried fish. We had uh, built 
kind of a special uh, canister, if you will. And we put cotton pads on the inside. And this is actually what the scent would bind to. So you run the vacuum and then the scent binds to this cotton pad. And as part of the experiment, we wanted to test drawing the air from two different locations to see if maybe one was better than the other, or maybe they're about the same. So the first test uh, involved taking an air sample from the bottom of the shipping container. So we used this teeny tiny little tube and it was attached to our, our canister and the pad is on the inside. And then we ran our vacuum. And then the second uh, part of the test was drawing an air sample from uh, the vents. So every shipping container has about four vents, if not more, and they're on uh, each side of the shipping container. So we drew air, and then we would give them to the dogs, um, present the odors to them. And in this case, we presented the odors on, uh, they call it a scent wheel. And for the entire experiment, uh, we would only have one target odor, one hot odor, if you will, on the wheel at any time. And the rest of the odors would be the distractor scents. So we would have one that was either the shark fin or, or elephant ivory, and the rest would be either a blank cotton pad, um, the smell of their food, uh, coffee, you name it. So each one of these had a different scent on it. And then the dogs, uh, were trained that uh, when they got to the target odor, they would sit in front of the canister. So, show you a video. So this is a training round. Um, the target odor is right here. Because this is a training round, um, that means what we're trying to do is make sure the dog knows what he or she is looking for. So we knew where the target odor was and we reinforced that, yes, she got that right. Therefore, she got to be rewarded with some treats. This video is actually part of the experiment. Um, this dog's named Benny and he's gonna find Ivory, which is right here. And like I said earlier, this is this is a game for them. Um, finding that target odor means that they get to play with their favorite toy. And it means for us, we know where the target odor is. So it's this this win-win situation. And it's also incredible just to see how amazing he He's currently analyzing the data to see how successful the dogs are at detecting um, wildlife contraband from just these air samples from our, our cheap Lowe's vacuum. And based on the results, we may need to do some, some more fine tuning. So we may need to uh, maybe fix some, some training behaviors. We might need to make some improvements to the vacuum or uh, how we're particular odors. And then we're going to take it to a port in either Africa or Asia, particularly a port where we know there's a lot of smuggled wildlife that's um, in shipping containers. And we're going to see if those port authorities uh, can use our technology and our instructions to have the same results. And we believe that they can. And so eventually we want to roll out this technology to as many ports as possible.
because I have always been a dog lover. Um, from my very first Dalmatian that inspired um, my first figure skating competition where I literally was a Dalmatian. Um, it's been such an honor to be able to work on two things that I, I love and I'm passionate about, which is conservation and dogs. And thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I think your connection might be a little bad because um, we lost you there uh, for a few seconds. So I don't know if you want to try like turning your um, camera off and back on. Maybe once you stop sharing your screen, things will get better. But um, I think your connection's a little rocky. Okay. Um, so if everybody's ready, we're gonna go ahead and dive into our question and answer portion of the program now. So just a reminder for those of you that are watching from the web page to place your questions in the Google form and we will try to weave as many of those in as we can. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with our groups on camera. Robin, if you wanna just stop sharing um, so we can make sure to have everybody on screen here. I can't, it's completely uh, frozen. <laughs> That's okay. Um, maybe your computer just needs a moment. <laughs> I think my computer needs many moments. There we go, okay. So let's start with, um, we'll go in the same order that we did introductions. So Ms. Kudrick's class, if you guys are ready first, um, we'll go ahead and have your first question. Remember, get nice in front of the camera, nice and loud for us so we can be sure to hear you. Go ahead, unmute your microphone. And Robin, if you um, feel ready, if you think your camera's gonna work, then you can turn it back on. If not, we will do our best here. Go ahead. Uh, how long does the training take for the dogs to learn what they have to learn? Could you repeat that one more time? How Get closer, long, you can take your mask off, go ahead. How long does it take for the dogs uh, the dog's training to learn what they need to? Great question. So um, the first step is you, the dogs need to understand the game, right? So once they understand the game, which is I need to find this target odor, then you can start adding even more sense. So um, I think the first time it takes a couple weeks and then once dogs understand what they're trying to do, then you can add more sense to their profile. So a lot of the dogs have um, like several dozen odors that they can detect at any given time. That was a great question. Um, okay, next up is Miss Aria Ratna's group um, from DW Poppy. If you're ready, go ahead, unmute your microphone and nice and loud for us. So right here. You can see. Uh, okay. So, uh, did they use any electric collar to train the dogs? Could you say that one more time, please? Did they use any electric uh, collars to train the dogs? No, they do not use that. It's all. Um, more positive reinforcement. So it's, they get rewarded by treats, their favorite toy. Um, a lot of these dogs have a lot of energy and they're very ball driven. Like they see a ball and all they want to do is play. And so you use that sort of um, motivation to your advantage so that you can teach them to find the odors that you need them to find. Okay. Another good question. Um, okay, Thank Kiara, you. if you're ready, you're up next. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Um, is there any specific breed of dog or characteristics that you like to train? Yeah, it's a great question. So the group that we were just working with, Working Dogs for Conservation, they're all rescue dogs. And really the what you wanna look for is uh, dogs that have a lot of energy and they wanna play, particularly they wanna play tug, they wanna play with the ball, but it's gotta be high energy. 
Okay, and Miss Sigmund's group, our first question asker. Hi, um, what happens when the dogs find something and what happens to the poachers? What happens to the poachers after the dogs find something? Great question. So one of the things that um, we wanna make sure that we're doing here is that we wanna make sure that we're minimizing contamination so that uh, if a dog alerts to um, a particular shipping container that might have smuggled wildlife in there, um, they're pretty certain that it's there. And so then it would, it, it's a whole other process. So um, customs have to be involved to open the actual container because they are sealed. And then from there, evidence is, is taken. So, um, and then as far as poachers, uh, it depends on the country. So uh, a lot of times we see in countries, wildlife crime isn't considered a serious crime, which is um, something that we would like to change because uh, wildlife is sort of a uh, high reward, low risk. So we're seeing a lot more criminal networks getting involved just because of the reward. So if we could get um, more of these countries making wildlife crime serious and it's there are more penalties, there's more jail time, then hopefully that would be a deterrent. Okay, let's take a few that came through the webpage here. So one question we got, Robin, is from Livy S. in Berlin, Massachusetts. And she wants to know if the dogs that you train sniff for more than just wildlife products, like are they used to sniff out drugs or diseases or bombs or anything like that? Great question. Um, and uh, I do know that there are different camps of people that would give you different answers. Um, so I think there's actually some healthy debate in, in the dog world about this. Um, some people say that it's just another odor. So dogs should be able to uh, smell anything as long as they're trained. And there are other dog trainers that would say, no, drug sniffing dogs need to stick to drugs and wildlife dogs need to stick to wildlife. So it, it I don't think there's actually a, a correct answer. Very good question. That was a good question. Um, another one here from Sean in Philadelphia is curious about how far away dogs can sniff things. Like, can they sniff something from hundreds of feet away or how close do they need to be? Great question. I think there's um, one analogy where let's say I were to spray perfume in my office. I could smell it. Um, dogs, you could have that same perfume in an enclosed sports arena and they would not only be able to smell it, but they would be able to smell what it contained, what other um, scents were inside of that one spray of perfume. Wow, that's very impressive. <laughs> very impressive. Okay, let's go back to our on-camera groups. We'll go through another round. Um, if you're ready, Mrs. Kudrick, you guys are up first. Just remember, unmute your microphone here when you're ready. Okay, go ahead. What was, what was your biggest find? What was my what? What was your biggest find? My biggest find with this test? Like, like, the dogs. yeah, like the dogs, like what was their biggest find? Oh, ooh, good question. Um, we were really surprised that, so we only ran the vacuum um, for two minutes and uh, the dogs uh, could find uh, shark fin. It was a little bit more difficult with ivory, but think about it. Ivory doesn't really have a smell, whereas shark fin does. Um, we were really surprised that just a short air sample um, the dogs could find. And then on top of that, one of the distractor scents we were using was um, some like dried fish. And uh, on the scent wheel, we had um, an air sample of dried fish. And we also had a sample of 
shark fin, which you would think that has to, like to us, that would smell the same, right? The dog could actually find shark fin, even if there was this other fishy scent on the wheel, which was incredible. Okay, Miss Ariaratna's group, if you're ready, go ahead. Once criminals find out about this, won't it cause them to be more proactive with shipping methods? Yeah, so ultimately what we wanna do is, um, because such a small percentage actually get searched and there are thousands that go through ports every day, make it a lot easier for port authorities to sample and um, to make sure that there's nothing smuggled that shouldn't be. Because in a, in a normal situation without the vacuum, in order to search the shipping containers, it takes a lot of time. So you have to like break the security seal, you have to have someone approve that, and then you have to empty out all of the contents of the shipping container and manually search it, and that could take hours. And you know these um, ports wanna move fast because Time is money, right? They wanna make sure that these shipping containers are going to their final destination. So this um, would help for a number of reasons. One, uh, we could sample and find out what's in there a lot quicker. We can sample a lot more. We don't have to, um, unless the dogs alert positively, we don't have to um, break the security seal and open the entire contents of the shipping container unless the dogs say, you know what, there's something a little funky in there. We should, we should have it opened. So it'll be a lot more efficient. Okay, next up is Kiara. Um, do you have any advice for kids who would want to do that career? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I'm still a kid who still loves conservation and dogs. I think it's, Find something that is that you're passionate about that inspires you. Um, conservation is a is a big field, and you can work with wildlife. You can work with more you know environmental things like forestry, um, climate change. It's it's a huge field, and um, I would say if you're passionate about it, um, keep you know, reading about it, keep, um, there's a bunch of things on YouTube you can watch about it. I think there's so many different ways that you can move forward and then obviously go to school for it as well. Okay, Miss Sigmund's class, if you are ready. Hi. Um, hi, so what is the most common animal product that you tend to see a lot, like, like the dog's one? Can you say that one more time, please? Nice and loud for us. Can you just repeat the question? <laughs> uh, what is the most common animal product that the dogs find? I still didn't catch that. So One more she, time. Um, Robin, she asked, like, what's the most common, like, wildlife product that the dogs would find, you think? I think it depends on the port. Um, so let's say, um, like, the port of Mombasa in Kenya, you're going to find a lot of uh, elephant ivory and rhino horn. Um, in Hong Kong, you might find a lot of shark fin. Um, Vietnam, you could find elephant ivory. It, it totally depends um, on the location. And that's one of the, the cool things that we want to do with the technology is it, it's um, sort of customizable. Um, it's just an odor that you have to teach the dogs to find. So whatever the, the key odors are or the, the key wildlife that's being smuggled in a particular port, that's what you can train the dogs on. So it doesn't just have to be elephant ivory or rhino horn. It can be whatever the problems are in that particular port. 
Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in through um, the website here. So I'm gonna ask a few there and then hopefully we'll have time for one more round with everybody on camera. So this question from Brock, Louisa and Reed from Boise, Idaho. Um, they're curious to know if there were scents that the dogs did really well with and ones that they maybe had a little bit more difficulty. Great question. Um, the dogs had no problem finding shark fin, and it was a little bit more difficult finding ivory. And even to our nose, right? Like shark fin smells, ivory doesn't. Um, so one of the things, you know, we were only running the vacuum for two minutes. So one of the, the next steps that we're gonna do is we're gonna do some computer modeling. Um, that'll help us inform how long we should be running the vacuum so that there is a good amount of scent on the cotton pads that the dog should be able to smell. So we just sort of decided to do two minutes because it was easy. We did do um, the last day, we did a couple rounds of 20 minute air draws um, and it was a lot easier for the dogs to find as well. And also, which was kind of fascinating, when we would open our little canister, the uh, cotton pad is dirty. Um, which really kind of shows you that the vacuum was working and we thought that was kind of cool. That is really cool. There's a lot of questions here. People want to know how you get these dogs to be <laughs> so, so good at this. Um, we had a question come in from Isabella from DES, which is a, it's an interesting question. Have you ever had dogs that don't cooperate? And if so, how long do you let them try before they flunk sniffer dog school? <laughs> Oh, that was a good question. Um, and I don't know if I, if I have the answer. Um, so it, it happens, right? There, there are some dogs that may have the high energy, but maybe they just don't have the focus. Um, and they're, they're not, they're not doing a good job. Um, actually we, we started with four dogs on this project. And one of them, uh, was a dog who was 13. Um, and she was just, you could tell she didn't want to do any of it. She kind of would just run around the scent wheel, kind of like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. But she's also 13 and um, has had a very successful sniffer dog career. So she was retired from our particular project, um, which really just meant she, um, I don't know, got to play all day and not didn't have to work. So it is, it is common um, that dogs might have to get pulled from different programs. Um, I don't know the, the percentage of, of dogs that are successful or not. I do know that there's a lot of investment that goes in time-wise just trying to get the dogs um, to be focused. And, and usually if you have the dogs with the high energy and the ball drive, um, it's pretty easy to keep them in, in the program because they, they want to play. Who doesn't want to play, right? So that one dog was just ready for retirement. That was just, wrong. Yeah, she's just ready for retirement. Was, <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> exactly. And that leads to another great question. Perfect segue here from Annalisa in Mrs. Smith's class in San Antonio. Like what happens to the dogs after they've kind of completed their service? So like, do they go back to being pets or like, where do they go? Oh yeah, Absolutely. Um, they go back to being pets. They go back to, you know, sleeping all day like my dog does. Uh, they live a great life. They've, they've done what they needed to do for conservation and now they can just rest and be pampered. That's great. Okay, let's go back to our on-camera groups. Now we have just about five minutes left. So we do have time for just one more quick round. So Miss um, Kudrick's class had to leave us. So let's go to DW Poppy. Um, if you guys are ready, we'll have you go first this time for your last question to Robin. Uh, would legalizing yet regulating the trade in animal derived goods be a more effective strategy for protecting the animals and increasing their population? Good question. Um, and it's and it's highly debated. Um, there have been and I don't know if you're, you're referencing, um, there's like fake rhino horn that has entered the market uh, and, or they've talked about doing like a, a fake rhino horn alternative. And there's also been um, like legalized sales of, 
of ivory in in China, um, where it was like a one-time thing. Um, the problem is traceability. Um, how if it's a one-time, you know, or limited offer um, of sale, how do you know it came from the approved, you know, stockpile or the approved um, allowance that is allowed to be traded versus something that has been illegally taken? So it makes it really complicated. Um, and ultimately, you know, it kind of comes down to behavior change and um, understanding why there's some consumer demand. So we do believe that understanding consumer demand, uh, social behavior um, is a better strategy than uh, legalizing, particularly ivory trade or rhino horn trade. That's another great question. Okay, Kiara, if you're ready, your last question for Robin. What's your favorite part of your job? Yeah, that's a good question. Obviously working with dogs, that's the best part. Um, I think for me, and I think many conservationists would say the same thing, is that we get into this field because we are perpetual optimists. We believe that um, no job is too small, that whatever we are doing, we are doing something right by wildlife and by conservation. And I think it's holding on to that, knowing that every every day at work I'm I'm contributing in a positive way for conservation is probably my favorite part. Um, and I think a lot of conservationists would absolutely say the same thing. And last but not least, Miss Sigmund's class. Did you go to college and what did you study? Good question. Uh, I went to University of Delaware uh, for my bachelor's degree, which is in wildlife biology and ecology. And I did my master's at Johns Hopkins University in environmental science and policy. Okay, we will wrap up our Q&A, which is one last question for you, Robin. Um, I know you kind of touched on this a little bit already, but um, Cool School from Nova Scotia was interested in kind of what advice would you give to kids or what is the best way for kids to get involved with this type of conservation work? So any last pieces of advice you would give to everybody? I would say that, um, you know, it's up to you guys. It's up to the future generations to make up for um, missteps that past um, generations did. So, you know, make responsible choices when it comes to, to buying things. I, um, it, we're not the only thing that lives on earth. So treat it as, you know, a shared property and wildlife absolutely deserve to be here as much as we do. And I would say, I remember when I was in school, you know, it was always said, it's up to your generation to make a change. And I would say the same advice now, it's up to you guys to make a change and carry whatever our generation did even further. That's great advice. Um, so we are just about at time. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. I wanna thank all of you that watched and submitted such great questions for Robin. A huge thank you to our on-camera guests. You guys did a great job and you had some really great questions as well. And obviously a huge thank you to Robin for spending some time with us and sharing about this really cool sniffer dog project. So before we head out, I wanna just share a few resources that may May be helpful to um, teachers and parents that are kind of related to this subject. You can find all of these on the Conservation in the Classroom webpage under ac additional activities. So don't feel like you have to um, write them all down right now. You can just find them on the webpage. But if you're interested, there is a Kahoot game that you can play that contains questions related to Robin's presentation. It is completely free to play. You just go to the website kahoot.it and enter that unique game pin that you see on your screen there. There's also activities related to wildlife crime in our 
Elephant Toolkit and our Lynn the Pangolin um, pack that we have available for free download on the Wild Classroom page. If you have questions that we didn't have time to get to today um, that you'd like me to pass along to Robin, I'd be happy to do that. You can email us at wildclassroom at wwfus.org. And last but not least, mark your calendars for our very last live stream of this school year. It is happening on June 8th, which is World Oceans Day. We will be joined by Dominic Andrade Brown, who is a marine biologist for WWF, and he's going to be talking all about coral reefs. So make sure you join us then. And I want to invite all of our camera holders to go ahead and unmute your microphone one last time and give a huge thanks and bye to Robin. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.